Reverend Payne Davis, the director of the Presbyterian Program. We would like to welcome you to the first presidential lecture for the spring semester. The prayer by Ms. Kara Faracho, who is a student at Metcalfe's College. Ms. Faracho, would you please stand, please? Let us pray. Thou who art almighty and merciful, creator and giver of every perfect gift, thou who art omnipotent and omniscient, ubiquitous in presence and unrestrained in love, make clear thy spirit in this college. Unfold thy mercy and thy knowledge, that as we feast upon the spoken word, we may be raised to a new level of consciousness. And then as we go forth into the world, give us a glow, a light, a sensitivity that draws those who are desirous of a new life to thee. Grant wisdom to those who lead us, patience to those who teach us, and understanding to those who are in constant search of truth. In all things, let thy hallowed name be praised as Lord of Lords and God of Gods. Amen. Amen. Now most of you from your various instructors know why you are here. You have been told by the instructors that this is somewhat of an enrichment program, an enrichment experience for you. But to be more specific in terms of our purpose for being, our Chief of Staff, Dr. Kawaku Ama, will now give you the statement of purpose, Dr. Ama. The Presidential Lecture Series, a component of the freshman year program, is designed to specifically provide an academic discourse between persons who have distinguished themselves as scholars and or empiricists and the mega Everest college student body. Careful consideration has been given to the selection of speakers whose areas of expertise are relevant to the various academic disciplines within the three schools of the college. The School of Liberal Arts and Education, the School of Business and Public Administration, and the School of Science, Health, and Technology. In addressing the needs of the students at Mega Everest College, the administration and faculty have concluded that the college can no longer view its mission in a narrow and myopic manner. Educational avenues must not limit the opportunity of students solely within the city and state of New York, or even America. Instead, the college has begun to provide educational experiences which will enable and empower its students for career opportunities in the global economy. The aim is to raise their level of consciousness and enable each person to develop an appreciation for the international community. The goal is to prepare them for the new world order as the 21st century approaches. An important part of creating globally educated students is exposing them to the ideas, concepts, knowledge, and people who can help them incorporate a global perspective into their personal philosophies. Consequently, by introducing students to these carefully selected lecturers, they are being exposed to many of the finest role models currently accessible to higher education. Thank you, Dr. Ama. Before Dr. Nawasiki comes to introduce the guest lecturer, I want you to prepare your minds as you listen to the lecture for questions that you may want to ask him at the end of his presentation. We'll place the mic on the side there, but you want to, as you talk, jot down questions in your minds about things perhaps that you may not have clarified or things from your own curiosity about him or about some of the statements that he makes. So think of questions as our lecturer will speak to you very shortly. I'm going to ask the provost, Dr. 
Dominique Nawasiki to come now and introduce our guest lecturer, Dr. Nawasiki. Thank you, Dr. Button. Good morning, everybody. Um, Dr. Edison o. Jackson, our president, is not here, and so it's my exciting and uh, great honor and privilege to introduce one of the most dynamic, young, articulate, socially aware and concerned African-American on the world scene today. I think this is particularly important because as we face the kinds of onslaught on social, economic gains that have been made over the many years, it's important that we have individuals who are willing, able, and excited about speaking out, analyzing situations, and hopefully helping us to find solutions to the issues that confront us today. Dr. Les Paines, and yes, Dr. Les Paines, because Medgevas College awarded Dr. Paine an honorary doctor of human letters in 1993, in part because we recognize the contributions he's made to the life of we as a people. And so today, my duty is exciting and pleasurable. It is to introduce Dr. Payne. He joined Newsday in 1969. As a correspondent, he reported extensively from many parts of the world, including Africa, Europe, Caribbean, the United Nations. In the wake of the 1976 Soweto uprising in South Africa, Dr. Payne traveled throughout South Africa and wrote an 11-part series that the Pulitzer Prize jury recommended for the 1978 award in foreign reporting, which indeed is a great honor. Upon the release of Nelson Mandela in 1990, Dr. Payne was invited back to South Africa where he wrote a series of articles on the historical changes taking place in the new republic. He's a founder of the National Association of Black Journalists, and since then has worked diligently to improve media employment practices and to expand the coverage of black and third world communities. Along with other reporters in 1974, Dr. Payne put together the 1974 Pulitzer Prize winning series, The Heroin Trail, which traced the international flow of heroin from the poppy fields in Turkey to the veins of drug addicts on Long Island. Many of you who tune on the television on Sunday mornings know that uh, Dr. Payne is a prominent feature of a program, Sunday Edition. He's received many, many awards. I'll just mention a few. Amongst them, the $10,000 World Hunger Media Award in 1983, the 1978 Tabakin Award from Columbia University, the Unity Award for Investigative Reporting from Lincoln University, the Howard University Journalism Prize, the 1987 and 1988 Commentary Award from the National Association for Black Journalists, and several associate pre Associated Press Awards for column writing. Additionally, in 1990, Dr. Payne won Cable Television's highest honor, the ACE Award, for an interview he did with Foyer Mayor Dinkins, the title of which was Les Payne's New York <laughs> Journal. He was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, graduated from the University of Connecticut, and served six years in the U.S. Army, where he attained the rank of captain. He's been places. 
He commanded an anti-aircraft missile battery and served three years as an information officer. During an assignment in Vietnam, he worked as an army journalist and wrote messages and speeches for General William C. Westmoreland. Together with his wife, Violet, they have three children and currently live in Huntington, New York. It is indeed my honor, my distinct pleasure, that on behalf of our faculty and staff to welcome Dr. Les Payne. Thank you, Dr. Nawasaki, uh, and good afternoon <clears throat> to uh, President Jackson, who could not be here today, and uh, Mr. Davis, who is the director of this freshman year program, Mr. Barton, uh, the program coordinator who is here, of course, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think I should say something, well, uh, even before saying that, I should say that introduction uh, took up a good bit of my time, so I'm going to cut my talk down. So at any rate, I'll, I'll hold my speech, hopefully, to something that interests you, uh, and if it does not, then we can certainly get to whatever interests you during the question and answer period. I do feel I should say something about this doctor business, because it is true that the last time I was here at Medgar Evers about a year ago, I was given an honorary doctorate degree uh, by this university. It was quite an honor and one of the best stuff I have received, and it was humbling. And I made the point then, and I'll make the point now, that you can imagine someone going through life uh, with my name. Uh, I've heard all the jokes. Uh, the people who write letters to the editor of Newsday usually spell my name P-A-I-N. Uh, and after, and, and when I was growing up, you know, the kids would say, you know, they'd call me uh, Novocaine, uh, all kinds of names. And uh, once I was given the uh, honorary doctorate degree, uh, I officially could refer to myself as Dr. Les Payne. Uh, if you think about it, it has a certain ring to it. Uh, when I was, before coming here, I asked uh, uh, Dr. Barton, what should I speak about today? And in his uh, mellifluous tones, he said, uh, uh, make it motivational. <laughs> and at that point, I thought perhaps he had mistaken me uh, for Les Brown, uh, who is a fellow who is married to uh, uh, Gladys Knight and is, in fact, a motivational speaker. Uh, I'm a newspaper man and a journalist, uh, and that is what I know, that is what I do. Uh, so I will kind of hold to that line a little bit. The other thing he told me was to talk about a little bit <clears throat> about, he said, share with the students how you got where you are, uh, which I would also try to do. Uh, but I must admit that talking about one's achievements can be a very risky business. I was at a dinner <clears throat> uh, about a couple of years ago when Carol Simpson of uh, NBC was given a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. And I was sitting at this table during this dinner uh, with a wag, a, a, a guy who was very, very funny. He was cracking jokes throughout uh, most of what had been going on in the program. And at one point, when Carol Simpson went to accept her uh, award, she said very pointedly, uh, if you know Carol, she's very dramatic, uh, she said, I uh, achieved my success by working my butt off. And the jokester at my table stopped and paid attention. And then Carol said, and usually when you see someone as successful as I am, and the person at my table says, they simply have no butts. <laughs> you may not be able to see, but I've not achieved Carol Simpson's level of success. However, I certainly subscribe to her view that the only way to achieve success in whatever field of endeavors that you may choose for your life's work is by if I may use her phrase, working your butts off, and that is starting with your studies here at Medgar Evers. So what I will do is talk a little bit about my background in journalism and comment a little bit, because I have to, on the current attack that we black African Americans and blacks from all over the globe are coming under uh, by the bell curve, by Herrnstein and Murray, by uh, the president of Rutgers University about our hereditary genetic background, which folks are saying render us kind of less intelligent than other folks. Obviously, so you will not confuse uh, my view on this. It's, it's, it's a myth, but beyond a myth, it is propaganda. And beyond propaganda, it is dangerous propaganda, which has a very specific design in these times. And again, whatever you're interested in, we can get at it in the question and answer period. 
As stated here, I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, and lived there under uh, what must be called a system of apartheid. Uh, and I stayed there until I was 12 years old. Uh, I don't know how many of you are watching the six-part series on immigration. Anyone watching the six-part series on immigration on Discovery Channel? Good. Uh, if, and if you don't have cable, and I know some of you don't, can't get it in some of these er excuse me, areas, what you might do is try to get uh, a copy of the cassettes. Because it is certainly worth seeing because it is the story of the African-American migration from the South. And you should know at the turn of the century that roughly 90% of the African-Americans in this country uh, were born in the South. Uh, those figures have shifted to about 50-50 uh, for a time, and now it's beginning to reverse. And I'll state that because, <clears throat> in addition to that, I would also recommend that you make a, a point during this Black History Month to go to the Metropolitan, uh, uh, the Museum of Modern Art. They are carrying a series by Jacob Lawrence, the African American painter, and you should know something about. Uh, that series is also on the migration of African Americans from the South, and it, in, in very graphic terms, explains in 60 panels what that movement was all about. So in the common sense, I think we can say that we were migrants coming up from the South, and we, my family, was a part of that migration which came up in the 50s, and we were as much immigrants to this country as were people who now are from the Caribbean or from Africa, China, Europe, or anywhere else. And one of the things I think you'll notice about that migration series, which plays against some of the common misunderstanding is that we did not come here north looking for welfare. We came looking for jobs. We were chased off that land by not only the bow weaver, but also by the lynchers and by the sheriffs and by the fact that we could not get jobs and the fact that we could not get decent education. Now, in Tuscaloosa, my first real introduction to academic achievement occurred when, as a youngster, I sat in a fourth grade class in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and that class was visited by a woman named Mary McClyde Bethune. And I hope that some of you have heard of her. If you have not, you should rush, not right now, but as soon as this is over, <laughs> to the library and find out who Mary McClyde Bethune was, uh, particularly during this Black History Month. And I remember sitting in the audience as a, as a young child uh, and hearing this very large and very dark and very determined and very articulate woman uh, explain to us how she, starting with a dollar and 50 cents in her pocketbook, uh, she went on to start a women's school in Daytona, Florida uh, in 1904. Ms. Bethune had been the daughter, she was the 15th child of uh, a couple that was born in slavery in Florida, and she was determined to do something about the lack of education that existed during that era. And I think that when you understand that during this particular time, education, the education that you have an opportunity to take advantage of here now, is being seriously attacked by people who are in power. We can get to that later. But what Mrs. Bethune talked about was how she started with a very small building. And this building, she explained, was made out of scrap wood and tin and it was constructed over a garbage dump. And it was the only land that the city would make available for the education of black students. And I remember her telling us, us then how she and her students had to smash berries to make ink. She talked about how they had to nail burlap sacks over the windows to keep the winter winds from coming out, from coming in. And she talked about how they would burn wood and use that wood as pencils in Florida because she did not have enough money for the kids and her students to do otherwise. Now, of that determination to build a community centered school of higher learning, Mary McClyde Bethune established a citadel of black learning and education at the turn of the century. And that vision is a vision that is responsible for Medgar Evers. And I'm sure you know part of the history here, but I think you need to look at it in a very special, particular way, especially during this particular month. Incidentally, uh, that school, school the college that she started is now called Bethune-Cookman College. Now, Ms. Bethune was the first national hero I ever saw in the flesh, and she has long been a role model of achievement for me. It has been, I think, starting there in the fourth grade, her inspiration that has kept me on the track uh, believing in education and inspiring me to hold on to what our dreams might be. Now, my dream was to become a writer, 
and whatever your dream and vision is for yourself, what I would, would recommend to you is that you hold to it, that there are going to be obstacles, and I don't think we should spend all the time talking about these obstacles, but we've got to spend some time talking about some of these obstacles. I first decided that I wanted to become a writer when I was in the 10th grade. And by the time I was a junior in college and I went to the University of Connecticut, uh, go UConn. Uh, UConn, by the way, is number one in basketball, in case you don't know that. I mean, I know some of you might. They're also number one in girls' basketball, or oh, women's basketball. They didn't have a women's team when I was going uh, to UConn. But at any rate, I just uh, mentioned that inside, so if you're, you're a betting person, uh, you might put a little money on UConn. But at any rate, uh, by the time I was a junior in college, uh, I had decided that I wanted to write the great American novel. But the problem, well, I had two problems. One is that I also wanted to eat two meals a day. And I didn't, and had not seen many writers who were eating two meals a day. Uh, but I had a more serious problem. Uh, and that is that I, at that point, had never seen a black journalist working for a mainstream daily newspaper. And so I had to debate whether I should teach or whether I should enter journalism. And I never wanted to teach, so I decided I would go and try to prepare myself for journalism. So I decided on the newspaper business when I was a junior uh, in college. The Charles Murrays and the Richard Hernsteins of that day, now these are the people who wrote this book, Bell Curve, that you hear so much talked about. But the Hernsteins and the Murrays of the 1960s when I was in college were preaching then that because of blacks' genetic, hereditary background, we could not become journalists. There were two newspapers in Hartford, the Hartford Current and the Hartford Times. Uh, the Times no longer exists thanks to the forces of good. Uh, I used to deliver the Current, but neither of these newspapers had ever hired a black journalist. And by the way, we are not talking about Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and we're not talking about the 1920s, we're talking about 1964 in Hartford, Connecticut. And neither one of these papers had ever hired a black journalist, and it was clear to me that they would no sooner have hired me than they would have hired a walrus. <laughs> Incidentally, <clears throat> the only uh, uh, black reporter that I had seen was a man named Bill Matney, uh, who was a very light-skinned fellow, and I didn't know that he was a uh, black reporter until much later. And I don't think he told the people at NBC that he was black until much later. But that's another point. Uh, against all evidence, I had listened to my parents' declarations that education was a way out. That was drilled into us in the South. And now here I stood uh, getting ready to graduate with a college degree uh, while white high school graduates were getting the job as reporters at these newspapers that I, as a black college graduate, could not get. Now, I was shaken to my very bones by a serious sense of despair, defeatism, rage, and yes, even a sense of inferiority. Now, those of you who were born in the North in these days uh, uh, probably don't know how debilitating is this sense of inferiority that we in the South had conditioned in us in the Old South. And then one fateful day, and I never forget the day that it was, it was June 5th, 1963, I attended a lecture at Bushnell Auditorium in Hartford, Connecticut. And this lecture turned my life around. It was, it was at night from 8 to about 10, 10.30. After listening to the speaker for two hours, I obtained a certain clarity that swept over me, uh, and it was like an epiphany. I no, I no longer felt lost and confused, and no longer gripped by a sense of despair and desperation. Gone was the anger and the rage and the unspeakable sense of hopelessness that I and many of my relatives and friends at that time, black, uh, shared, and it accrued from the sense of inferiority that society had so instilled in us. And all of this kind of slid away from me like snow off a roof. And I borrowed that metaphor from the man who gave the lecture that night. His name, of course, was Malcolm X. So as the commentator says, you know the rest of the story. But I want to just give you a comment about what he said, because some of you, I know none of you have a sense of inferiority now. That is all gone. But we were gripped by it, and I maintain that the only difference, the only bar, the only hurdle, really, standing between us and liberation, between us and empowerment, 
is a sense of inferiority that has been drilled into us, not just in this country, but in other places where we have been situated. And what happened and what Malcolm said to me uh, that was so revealing, up until that point, you should know, uh, we in the South and in Connecticut as well referred to ourselves as Negroes. We were not, we wouldn't dare accept the term black, even someone as dark as I am. Uh, and my brother was darker than me. And when we were growing up in Alabama, I used to call him black and run and run uh, because he was bigger and he was older and you did not use the term black. And so this was something that we were escaping and running away from. And during these, this two hour lecture that night, Malcolm said something in a very succinct way. He said, and he knew he was talking to, and I felt almost as if he was talking to me directly. He said now, and he kept using the term black, 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 and every time he used the black, all of the good Christians out in the audience, you know, and, it, and they, it was about 50, the audience was about 50% black, 50% white. And as he used the term, whenever he would use it, you know, we would kind of cringe up. And at one point he paused and he looked down and he says, now, I know you don't want to be called black. He says, but what else are you? He said, you want to be called Negroes. And he said, but what does Negro mean except black in Spanish? So what you're saying is that it's okay to call me black in Spanish, but don't call me black in English. And for me, that had such a profound, you cannot understand how profound, it sounds simple, it sounds like nothing, but it was a thing that I had been searching for because it was a thing that we had spent a lot of time running away from, and it was a stick that the oppressive society had used at that point to instill a sense of inferiority and to lower our expectations about what we were capable of. Now, those of you from the Caribbean, where black, or Africa, where blacks are in the majority, clearly have probably a slightly different experience with that sense of inferiority from a history of, from your history of European domination. Because as Jomo Kenyatta once said that the difference between Africans there and African Americans who found their way here and in the Caribbean, he said is that the European took the land away from the Africans and they took us away from the land. And that is the only difference. And when you travel in Africa, when you go over there thinking that acting as if you own Ford Motors and General Motors and relating to the African because they don't have toilets in some cases that flush, I think you need to understand what that history is. Because at the time, the Europeans were sailing around the Cape of South Africa, settling that later republic. They were also, the Portuguese were also shipping us here. They were taking the lands away from the Africans and they were taking us away from the land. But the result in our experience, of course, is different. And therefore, we have a slightly different outlook. But what I maintain is that that outlook should unify us and not separate us. And by that, I'm talking about Africans from Africa and Africans from the Caribbean and Africans from Georgia and from Connecticut and even Africans from Long Island. Now, the thing that you notice is that uh, African students, I've noticed, have only a remote idea of this sense of inferiority, and I think that is one of the major differences between Africans on the continent and Africans here, is that they have not, they have been, for the most part, spared this overwhelming sense of inferiority. Nigerians, for instance, have no sense of it at all. Uh, Nigerians feel and know that they are superior to everybody, white or black. I don't know how many of you have been to Nigeria, certainly Lagos, but Nigerians don't have that problem. Incidentally, they talk about our performance on the SAT scores. But I think one of the things that you'll find is that African students, and so it's a head game. It's a sense of what your expectations are for yourself. Uh, and I think that what the records will show is that African students, and many of them tend to go into the hard sciences, score as, higher, as high or higher than whites on the entrance examination, and they perform as well or better in the classroom. And I think you'll find that uh, uh, Francis Lawrence, the president of Rutgers, didn't make any mention of this. Uh, Hernstein and Charles Murray don't make any mention of this. And you'll also find that Caribbean students score higher initially. But by the time of the second generation, these students run into the same racism as blacks born here. And the scoring and some of the other reactions to this system of apartheid began to equalize and the scores are the same. And I advance the, it's not even a theory because I've traveled in South Africa, is that America, this republic, 
is the world's most successful experiment in apartheid. Now, we used to talk about South Africa. I've been in South Africa. I've been banned from South Africa. Uh, I've been thrown out of South Africa for many years. Uh, but this country, not South Africa, is the world's most successful experiment in apartheid. So, uh, and, and, and what students find when they come here, whether they're from Nigeria or Zambia or from Ghana, Grenada, uh, Guyana, Jamaica, Haiti, is that the same cab driver that passes me up on 57th Street, it will pass you up. He doesn't stop and say, are you from Jamaica? No, zoom, he's gone. The same uh, funds that they're cutting off from colleges here at Medgar Evers, they cut them off whether you are from the Caribbean or from Zambia or from the north end of Hartford. The same hospitals that Mayor Giuliana is now trying to close, he's trying to close the Harlem Hospital. He doesn't say uh, most of those people from the Caribbean, are they from Africa, or what are their roots? No, you know that they're black. So I think it is that commonality that should unite us instead of dividing us. So I recommend that while working our butts off and uh, being aware of this racism, that I think that we should not allow it to be uh, overwhelming in our lives, but we have to pay some attention to it. Now, I am sure that Herrnstein Murray and President Lawrence are all wrong about this issue of black intellectual inferiority. Uh, blacks are not marked from birth with a curse of intellectual inferiority. Our curse, rather, is that since the time of slavery, we have been conditioned to believe that we are inferior to those who have oppressed us. And to the degree that blacks reject this false sense of inferiority is to the degree that we are able to take our place in the sun and in the marketplace. Now, getting back to uh, uh, my predicament, in my case, with no prospect for a newspaper job. I had a college degree in 1964. Uh, I took my English degree, and like a lot of other black college graduates who did not want to go uh, uh, work in civil service, uh, I went into the Army and hid out, as you've heard introduced here. And then, as now, the same government that makes it very difficult for black men and women to get a job made it very easy for us to join the Army and go abroad to fight for someone else's right to get a job. I'll say that again. Then as now, the same US government that made it very difficult for my generation of black men and women to get a job made it very easy for us to join the army and go abroad and risk our lives so that someone else can have freedom and a job. So serving in the military is an obligation of citizenship. I always advise young men and women, black men and women, to avoid the military uh, until such time that we can share fully and equally in the benefits of U.S. citizenship. If we're going to share in the obligations, then let's make sure we share in the benefits. Again, on my quest to become a writer, uh, starting with the Watts riots and the riots in Newark and elsewhere, the young brothers and sisters started fires and sacrificed a few of their lives in order to free up some jobs for us. Now, interestingly, before the riots, newspapers like the Hartford Times and the Hartford Current had no jobs for black reporters like myself or prospective black reporters like myself. But after the riots, they were looking on the rocks to give us jobs. So much for nonviolence in this country. It was a similar expression of protest that brought Medgar Evers into being, as I'm sure you are aware. I was at a function the other night. Uh, we were given an award to Gil Noble uh, for his survival uh, in television for 25 years. I don't know how many of you know Gil Noble, but uh, what he has done is masterful. He's done it pretty much by himself. And I, I made the point then that I knew, uh, when I first met Gil, I knew that he had been influenced by Malcolm X. And I knew it because Gil didn't kowtow because if you're influenced by Malcolm X, the real Malcolm X, you do not kowtow. And I also later found out that Gil was also uh, a Maroon uh, from Jamaica, so he was kind of double dipping. Those of you from Jamaica will know what I'm talking about. Uh, so Malcolm X taught Gil Noble also that he belonged to the black community and that he did not belong to ABC. Now we have a lot of people who think we belong to Newsday and to the New York Times, and to ABC, and to Sears, and to IBM. 
What Malcolm taught us is that we belong to the community and that our efforts should be used to try to help liberate to the degree possible the prerogatives of that community. Now, in his autobiography, that's Gil Noble's biography, and I want to quote this because it's what we must believe in the business of journalism if we are to really do what is required of us. Gil wrote in his book, Black is the Color of My TV Tube. I don't know how many of you read that, but it's an interesting title. Gil wrote, quote, my presence in television is the direct results of the black struggle. But for the social upheaval of the 50s and the 60s in America, I believe that I would not now be working in television. And this commitment on Gill's part was tested many times over. Uh, it made him stand out in the business of television for 25 years, and it's helped him to gain the support of the community. And that there are a lot of journalists, by the way, I won't call any names up here, uh, but you know them, uh, who are black, and who will tell you that they are not uh, black journalists, that they are journalists who just happen to be black. They just happen to be black. And I often make the point that in all of my years on this planet, I've never known a black mother to give birth to a journalist. I mean, I've never heard it said that Mrs. James Walker in the Harlem Hospital yesterday gave birth to a seven pound, six ounce journalist. <laughs> and, but, but I think that the newsroom uh, carefully select the kind of reporters and journal journalists and editors who work in these positions because journalism is very, very influential these days and these people are very carefully selected. Uh, and not just in journalism, but in all of these fields. And I don't have to tell you, you know this, I just want to talk about the career that I've worked in for over 25 years. Now, typically, uh, and I know a lot of you are tuned in on the O.J. Uh, case, but typically in his book just out, for example, O.J. Simpson from Behind Bars says now, quote, that he's more aware of his race than ever before. <laughs> and I bet he is. So people like Gil didn't wait until the water got up around his neck. You have to organize and work and appear in the community when the water's down around your ankles. And whatever field it is you go into after you leave uh, this campus with your degree, I think that you must, if you get nothing else from what I have to tell you, that I think that you betray your education if you just simply take your degree and go from this place and work only for your own uh, fulfillment. Until such time that we have achieved our empowerment, I think that you are duty bound to go out and work on a double track, which is to say to become the best professional you can, can become, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer or a mechanic or an engineer or a journalist, but also on the other track, I think you have to organize and make sure that systems are put in place so that you won't allow the Giuliani's and the Newt Gingrich's and the Pataki's of the world to vamp on the community. And they have every intention of vamping because they're right outside the door now with an ax. <laughs> While you're watching ER and uh, 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 the hospital, another soap opera hospital, they're closing down Harlem Hospital. While your eyes are shut watching these soap operas, these folks are very, very serious about cutting back on whatever achievement the generation ahead of you have managed to uh, get through. Now I'll mention just a few stories just to give you an idea of what my background is and, and we can talk about these later if you're interested. I'll just cite a few stories that I've investigated as a reporter over time. Uh, I've investigated the uh, King assassination uh, which led, by the way, my investigation led to the formation of a U.S. House investigation of the assassination of both Martin Luther King and President Kennedy, Kennedy uh, back in the 70s and the early 80s. I also uh, investigated, it was mentioned here, the heroin trail, which won a Pulitzer Prize in 1974. And the purpose of that story was to trace the flow of heroin from the poppy fields in Turkey through the French connection and into the veins of junkies in New York City. And at that point, 80% of the heroin was coming out of Turkey. Uh, and, and now you know what the problem is. Uh, but the political sense of this, and I want to make this point because a lot of folks are confused. Let me tell you, and I'm speaking as an investigative uh, journalist, and, and if you want to read it, you can read it in a book called The Heroin Trail, which is what the book we wrote 
off of the series, is that the influx of drugs into Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant in the late 60s and the early 70s was a political act. It was allowed to come in there, and I'm not talking rumor, I'm talking as a reporter. It was designed, what had happened, by the way, is that in the late 1950s, gang wars were very were rampant uh, in New York City. I was in Hartford at the time, uh, thank God, uh, because they had some rough gangs here. The Egyptian, the sportsman, on and on, every block. You know, they had these terrifying gangs. And what was happening at the late 50s and the early 60s is that there were people who you should be influenced by now who were beginning to come on the scene. There were people like James Baldwin who was beginning to write and tell African Americans and others who the real enemy was. And that it was not the brother whose head they were cracking every night, but that the real enemy was quite somewhere else. Uh, uh, France Fanon was beginning to write uh, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, uh, Black Skin, White Mass. Uh, and Malcolm X, yes, was on the scene. And so I think it was determined that by the people in power at that point that it was far better that black youngsters, particular young men, were strung out on heroin than for them to be strung out on Baldwin, France Fanon, and Malcolm X. And this is how drugs got into this community. It, it is a weapon that is used against you. It is a weapon that has been used to neutralize the, the community. And I think that people who have fallen for this, you know, and I know uh, crack and heroin uh, are very addictive drugs, but I think that we have to realize what Malcolm taught us and what the Nation of Islam taught us about drugs, both how to avoid them and how to get off of the drugs once you get on them. But the point that I want to throw out as an investigative reporter is that you'll hear people saying that that is nonsense. But I'm here to tell you that we want to pull a surprise for the investigation, and it is not nonsense. It happened. Uh, one of the other, some of the other stories I've investigated was the Soweto Uprising, June 16, 1976. I covered that story uh, and was thrown out of uh, South Africa. Uh, I, by the way, I've been thrown out of six countries. Uh, three of them, three of them at gunpoint. Uh, however, I can go back into all but two of them. Uh, uh, South Africa was one of them. I was thrown out of South Africa by the South African government. And not only did they throw me out, but they declared that no reporter, editor, white, black, Jewish, Spanish, didn't matter, would ever be allowed to go back into South Africa as long as Les Payne worked for Newsday. And what would happen is that a editor or a reporter would go and said, I would like to go to South Africa to cover this story. And uh, the South African Consul General or one of his assistants would say, uh, what paper are you from? He says, I'm from Newsday. And then what would happen is that these people always gave them my permi permission to denounce me, because you kind of have to do that to denounce me to, to, to hope, if you had any hope of getting a visa. And so they would denounce me. They would say, well, you know, I work for Newsday, but I don't like Les Payne. Uh, I don't like his mother. Uh, he won't even be allowed to read my stories, even after they get into the paper. And then uh, invariably, the consul general would say, but does Mr. Payne still work for the paper? Yes, visa denied. So that's been my experience with South Africa. However, I might add that once Mandela was released in 1990, I was invited back in by the government. They had to eat crow and invite me in by name. And I don't want to get into the details of it now. But because those people who had done the bidding of the South African apartheid government, those reporters who had written the stories as the South African government would accept them, those people had no credibility they knew and now writing about whether or not there had been changes in South Africa. So my point in that, and I think the lesson is that, is that hold to what you believe, what, what you believe, and don't be rocked by whatever convention comes along. And don't ever allow yourself, whether you become a policeman or whether you become an IBM computer expert, never allow yourself to just simply go along, uh, as we say in that old saw, to get along. Uh, as long as I mentioned some of the, the other countries that I was thrown out of, by the way, I was thrown out of uh, Rhodesia by the Ian Smith regime, uh, and Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, and now I can go back to Zimbabwe because I covered uh, Robert Mugabe, who was the prime minister when he was fighting as a guerrilla uh, out of Mozambique. Uh, Fazanu, uh, I was thrown out of uh, Corsica when we were investigating the drug flow. The Corsicans were the people who ran the French Connection 
So I went to Corsica to investigate the number one heroin drug smuggler in the world, a man named Marcel Franzisi. And uh, they did not like that once they found out I was on the island. And uh, they said, I mean, we were, I was literally running down the back streets of Ajaccio, which is the capital of Corsica, uh, uh, and luckily made the last plane out of there. It would not have been pretty. I was thrown out of Haiti uh, by the Tom Tom Macoutes when Jean-Claude Duvalier was there. And I went there to investigate, you know, what the condition of the Haitians who were leaving, whether it was political or economic reason, and what was happening to some of the money that was going down there. I was run out of uh, uh, Uganda by the State Research Bureau. And the State Research Bureau was Idi Amin's uh, uh, secret police. And uh, let me tell you, when they knock on your door, uh, you start thumbing through your dossier very, very quickly. And finally, I was, I was also th uh, thrown out of Turkey when we were investigating the heroin business. And I was also thrown out of, uh, out of, uh, as I said, Haiti, Haiti, Rhodesia, South Africa, Turkey, Corsica, uh, and Uganda. Those were the six countries I've thrown out. I can go back to all of those countries now, except Turkey uh, and Corsica. So two out of six is, is, is not bad. Now, I should add, as a journalist, I don't preach, you know, doing dangerous stories and getting run out of countries, but uh, it, it has worked for me. Uh, in terms of, other than Haiti, some of the stories that I reported on out of there were uh, the, the Michael Manley's uh, uh, regime in Jamaica uh, back before he was, he was replaced. Uh, and we can talk about any of that that might interest you. Uh, but I want to make two final points before I close, and we can open this up for question on this bell curve business. Uh, I mean, I had a, I had a spiel here, and I, I just want to cite two anecdotes. Uh, I write about this fairly often. If you're interested, we can, we can have sessions separate from this one, because I think it is very dangerous. People are afraid, black intellectuals even, are almost afraid of this bell curve business. And one of the reasons they're afraid of it is because it has too many statistics in it. It has too many charts. It has too many graphs. And these people have been taught to believe that if you can summon enough charts and graphs and statistics, then you must be right. Well, let me tell you, this is all nonsense. I mean, these charts and statistics are undernourished. And they also play into a pattern. They are cutting the budget. They are getting you out of these schools. They want to block you from these careers. And so now they need an ideology which says that by birth, your genetic hereditary background does not qualify you, no matter how much you work, does not qualify you for these jobs. So get back, lower your expectation, and accept that you're, have, you have been cursed by Ham, which is really what uh, uh, Lawrence was talking about. He was talking about the curse of Ham. And those of you who don't know who that is, what that is about, you should go and study what the curse of Ham is. This is what this man is talking about, slip or no slip. And it is designed to make the world safe for these shrinking jobs to remain in the hands of the people who have them and in power, that power will remain in the hands of people who have the power. One, one last example, the, the, this attack on black intelligence comes around periodically. There was, for instance, a study in 1840 which was put out by the U.S. Census. This is from the State Department, the Department of State. And what the State Department report showed then supposedly, and it was later proven to be fake, it showed that there was a higher degree of incidence of mental breakdown among African Americans who were living in the North than there were African Americans who were living in the South. And of course, in 1840, those African Americans, those well, they were, they were not Americans then, but those blacks who were living in the South were slaves. And so what this report, phoning up, was designed to prove is that Blacks in the North could not adjust to this freedom. Blacks in the South were happy. They had fewer nervous breaks down. They had fewer depression. You know, they were not racked by mental disorders. And so what this phoned up State Department official report was designed to do, of course, was to show that we couldn't handle freedom. We couldn't handle uh, liberation. We could not handle uh, conditions outside of slavery. And so I think that this similar situation existed for us in journalism. 99.99% of the journalists in 1964, when I got out of college, were white. And the Herrnstein said that we were not suited for journalism. Leave it alone. 
This stuff is not what you should be interested in. This, uh, this ABC and CBS and Newsday and New York Times is not the kind of stuff that you should be writing. Let us handle that. And if, luckily, the brothers and the sisters threw those, bro those rocks and lit those matches and freed up some jobs, and that's why we're here. And I think it is therefore incumbent upon us to remember that, and those of us who yet have our wits about us still remember that. I think I'll quit here and answer whatever questions you may have. Chief of Staff, if you would come forward and handle the question and answer period. If you have a question, come right up to the mic there, and the Chief of Staff will recognize you. Thank you, Dr. Biden. <clears throat> Please make your questions succinct, and call out your name so we know who you are. Yes, sir. Learn louder. Trust you, smile. Okay. That's my name. Uh, I wanted to know how do you feel about President Clinton's uh, agenda for the nation, and does he play a, part, a big role in the black inferiority process? If you're, if you heard the question, what the, it was President Clinton. What did I feel about President Clinton, and does he play a role in, in the black inferiority complex? I think I think he does. He's a part of that southern system. He's a part of the Southern system, <clears throat> which uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Southerner from Arkansas, and his, his roots go way back. And uh, I think that in terms of how he governs as a president, I mean, his problem is that he's a man who tacks with every win. The man doesn't make up his mind. And on the one hand, he has come to uh, uh, become president because of the black vote, and because of the black vote in Arkansas, he was made governor time and time again. And he has quite a lot of solid black support. But I think that when you look at the kind of choices he's made and the kind of people that he surrounds himself with, if you go back to the Jesse Jackson Sister Soldier uh, uh, episode, uh, I think an independent-minded African-American leader who enjoys the support of the African-American population will have problems with him. But those people who are less independent you know, uh, will have less of a problem. In other words, Alani Grenier is too strong, Jesse Jackson too strong. But I think that, you know, this uh, Dr. Foster seemed to be about uh, his speed. I, I have one more question. Uh, most of his cabinet uh, are people of color. Um, what would you say about that? Uh, well, not most of his cabinet, but he has, he, has made, he has made a lot of, and let me make this point. It's a good point to make, and, and let me not be glib and, 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 and cavalier about this, that one of the good things that Clint, President Clinton did, in fact, do is that he named a lot of African Americans to put cabinet posts that previously had not been named, uh, had not been given to, 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 to African Americans. And I think that he should be uh, lauded for that, no matter what you might think of the people who fill those positions. I think that was, that was positive. I think also what has not been said is that the huge blowback effect, the attack that he has come under, I think has much to do, by the way, with those uh, uh, appointments. All right, uh, and by that I mean that you can look at the people who are attacking him, the New York Times and others. They attacked Vernon Jordan when he was head, head of the co-director of the transition team. You know, he was he was he was attacked for sitting on the board of R.J. Reynolds, and R.J. Reynolds designed the Joe Campbell. It was unbelievable. Alani Grenier, you know, with the position that she was going to be named to. So I think that if you look also at the people who've left the. Uh, 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 the, the cabinet positions and those positions now, most of them have in fact been black. You know, uh, the, the Surgeon General uh, is gone. Uh, the former Chancellor at Stony Brook uh, is gone. Ron Brown is under constant attack. And so I think that the right is attacking those few gains that were in fact given. Good afternoon, Dr. Payne. My name is Terrence Hughes, and I just wanted to extend my personal thanks to you for being an inspiration to me. I've written to you on several occasions, and you've responded to me in a very personal manner, and I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else don't feel that, that, that we're unapproachable? I mean, you can give me a call at, at Newsday, the number's in the book, or drop a line. I can't always respond, because I get so much hate mail, I can't respond to the mail that isn't hate mail. I'm so shocked when I get a letter that isn't calling me, you know, nigga, go back to Africa, uh, that I, it takes me a couple of days to recover. 
Yes, uh, my name is Serge Wimpo. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming to share with us your knowledge and experience in our life. And uh, my question to you, sir, is that uh, during the 1984 presidential um, campaign, um, DC Jackson won for president. And to that effect, there was a private um, statement that he made to uh, the journalist, I believe, that he worked for uh, the New York Post. That was a confidential statement. And then he came out and stated that the Hami town in the city. And that ever since, it never can be really cold. So what's your opinion about that? Would you report that if you were um, GC and, and share that with you, that public statement? Yeah. Okay, this is the uh, statement in 1984 Jesse Jackson made about Hami Town, which was given to the Washington Post, by the way, not the New York Post. Uh, given to a man named Bill Coleman, who was black, in a conversation at the airport, supposedly off the record. Uh, so I think that, and I've written about this, by the way, so don't think I'm just here before students trying to, be, trying to, trying to juice it up. I wrote about it at the time, uh, publicly uh, uh, and, and widely, is that I don't think that it should have been reported because I think that once you uh, lay the groundwork, if, if, if it's given off the record, that means that you will not connect that statement to him. You know, you've given your word, and our word is journalists, all we have. So I don't think without clearance or some understanding, you could possibly report that unless you want to blow the source or unless reporting of that name in this particular point was so important that you would want to violate the word that you've given to him. So no, I've written it and I still believe that it should not have been reported. Uh, if it had been reported, by the way, I think Milton Coleman, by the way, did not report that comment under his own byline. His name was not on that story. You know, it was someone else's byline on the story. So I think if you're going to report it, it should be under your own name. And if you do it, you should do it knowing that you violated a confidence and therefore your word to any source should not mean anything anymore. And that beyond that, I think that you leave yourself open for whatever criticism come your way. Okay, thank you. Dr. Pay, my name is Ben Cotterell, and I want to congratulate you for being such an outstanding uh, news reporter. And I always watch your program, Channel 2. I know you're having a hard time, but I know that you are one of my role models and a role model for many other people. So I want to congratulate you for that. Yes, but, uh, I also would like to ask you, uh, what is the message that you hope uh, the people and people of African descent to, uh, to get from or achieve from your writings? From, from whose writing? From yours. From my writing? From my right, I mean, I write a column, those of you may not know it, I write a column once a week. Uh, that's not my main job, by the way. I mean, I'm an editor. I run the national news, all of the, the, the national, I'm an assistant managing editor at Newsday, which is to say I'm responsible for the national news, the foreign news, the state news, and the science news that appear in the paper. In addition to that, I write a column once a week. Uh, and what I do with that column is I try to represent my views. Uh, and I, I do two things with that. A lot of columnists, when they write, they allow themselves, black uh, uh, columns allow themselves to be put on the defensive. They find themselves defending themselves about, well, we are not all on welfare, we're not all on this, we're not all on that. My view is that I don't defend hardly anything. I always attack. You know, I refuse to be forced into a defensive, apologetic uh, position. That's a position that the dominant society want you in. They want you to get on your knees and start defending yourself. What I do is to attack. Uh, so what I want, I would like students to bring away from that is a number of things. One is do your homework and research these things because you can't write a point of view like that in a, uh, I mean, I, I started writing my column in Newsday and the readership of Newsday is 95% white on Long Island, 95% white. And the editors uh, uh, were 97% white. So you can't write a point of view like that unless you do your homework and you argue very tightly. So I think that on the one hand, uh, it is a given that you become the best profession you, professional you be can become and argue your position well, but have the courage to stand behind those positions. And my personal addition to column writing is that always seize the initiative. And I'll just cite this by one example. It's a good friend of mine uh, named Derek Jackson. And Derek Jackson is a columnist now for the Boston Globe. And, uh, and I'm, I'm using this anecdote just to describe what I do vis-a-vis -vis what he does. And he's a, he's a, he's a very fine uh, uh, columnist. And so he wrote, uh, he wrote on the Yusuf Hawkins uh, uh, episode from a few years back. And it was a very good column. And the gist of it was that he woke up. He was so disturbed by what happened to Yusuf Hawkins that he would wake up in the middle of the night uh, in a cold sweat, all right, because it so terrified him, right? And so he put this in his column. 
all right? And then he went on to say good things about how this was bad and it argued it very well. And so he asked me what was my view of that column. And I said, well, I thought it was a good column. And then he sensed that I had some reservations. So he said, no, what do you really think about it? I said, well, here's what I really think about it. I said, I think it was good except for the beginning, all right? I said, at the beginning of that column, you put in there that you woke up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, terrified by what the, this white mob had done to Yusuf uh, uh, Hawkins. And I said, now, that may be true. I said, but I've never woke up in the middle of the night. But if I had, I would not have put it in that column. Because what I want to do with my column is I want to make the white folks wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Thank you. Dr. Payne, I am Dorothy Hopkins, and thank you for substantiating my judgment that you were worthy of being called a doctor. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I made the recommendation. I'm bragging. Yeah. Um, I'd like well, thank you again. <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, in your article on Sunday, you talked about the genetic slip that packed the curtain. I wish you would say to students, just in summary, the response and emotional and otherwise you had to the grade of BS when you submitted the paper. Yes. Who's lower, whatever his name was? Yeah, Putzel. Right, thank Max you. Max Putzel. She's talking about a column that I wrote in Sunday's paper, and those of you who don't know what this is about can get the columns in Sunday's Newsday, or if you, you call Newsday and we'll send it to you. We'll fax it to you or put it in the mail to you. So you can see, the incident is this. And what it, what it, what it shows is that even when you achieve what you, we, you often run into, and I hope you don't run into it here, but I'm sure you've run into it along the way in, in secondary school. You run into teachers and professors who have lowered an expectation for you. See, the danger of what Lawrence said is that what it says is that not only the way they want you to react, they want professors to know that, look, these black folks, whether they're from Africa or the Caribbean, don't have it genetically. And no man are teaching, it's not you, the teacher. It is them, they can't learn this stuff. They can't learn calculus or whatever, all right? So I encountered a, a professor, an English professor, when I was a sophomore at the University of Connecticut, this, it was in this column, and I wrote a paper, you know, and it was on, in English literature. And so he gave his paper back to me, and he had written across it BS, you know, which I thought was a very strange grade. Uh, so this was very intimidating. This is, by the way, University of Connecticut was largely all white. I mean, I was one of the few blacks there. It was less than the population of, uh, the black population of University of Connecticut when I went there was 0.003. Now, by the way, it's less than 3%. You see, UConn is number one, but the, the black population is less than 3%. At the University of Connecticut right now, nothing I'm proud of. I don't contribute to the alumni fund. But I mean, I'll state this and pass on. So at any rate, I wrote this paper. I was the only black in the class, so he always knew who I was. And, and, I was, and so he gave me this BS. So I finally, it took me you know, days to get up my courage. So I finally went back, and I wasn't, you know, like I am now. I mean, right now, I'd be in his face, like, right now, you know. But back then, I'm a student, and this is a professor, and, you know, and, and, and I was intimidated. Uh, and so I said, uh, finally, you know, I would wait after class, and then there still students hanging around. I would go away, and then finally, I got the moment. You know, I walked up to him uh, with this paper uh, that I had written, and uh, he had this BS. And I really didn't know what it meant. I said, uh, you know, could you explain to me what this grade is? So he said, uh, he said, you know what it is. It means bullshit. <laughs> And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you know you didn't write that paper. All right? He said, you know you didn't write that paper. And then the, the rest of his conversation was such. It wasn't, he did not accuse me of plagiarism. He did not accuse me, as he did other students, of saying that, you know, you probably stole this from, uh, from uh, Stephen Crane or you lifted this from an essay of Hemingway's or someone else. He said the substance of his criticism and his BS grade to me was that I was incapable of writing such a paper. That's what he said. That I, and he assumed that because, A, he knew I was black because I was the only black in the class, right? And, uh, and, and I would lie if I told you I had the correct response, which I would have now. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I cried, but I know tears welded up. I was totally humiliated. And uh, for the rest of the semester, now, he, this, this was early in the semester, and this was designed to get me to quit the course or to have a lower expectation of myself. And the anecdote, I'm sure you've experienced this before. If you, you, if you go through your life, you've experienced this. You know, and not all of them are white professors. Some of them are black professors and black teachers. They have lowered expectation for you. You perform this and you couldn't have written this. All right? Now, so I went through this whole course, 
You know, I could barely look at this guy, and I, I wrote this in the columns, very honest column. I could barely lift my eyes at like, this, this great uh, doctor, Professor Putzel. Mm -hmm. And so I stuck out to the end of the course, and then drew, throughout the course, taking a lot of quizzes in class, then he began to find out that despite being black, you know, that I was not stupid. So then he uh, began to, uh, in his own mind, appreciate, you know, what this was about. So what he did in those days, uh, we would leave, I don't know if you do it anymore, everything is so computerized, but we leave postcards. Uh, we used to leave postcards, I'm sure you remember this, for the professor to send our grades home at the end of the semester. You know, you're giving your test, you leave a postcard, and self address of course, as postcards were then. Three cents then, by the way. How much are postcards now? Whoa! Three cents. <laughs> and uh, so this is what he sent back to me. And I've carried this, you know, uh, I don't carry it with me all the time, but I brought it here today. All right, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Celeste Payne, 13 Russell Street, Hartford, Connecticut. That, I grew up in Hartford, and that the apartment building been torn down. Semester grade, English 108B. It says B, and then he says, and my apologies for a hasty judgment and obviously unfounded suspicion. Good luck. One, one last thing, because this really is at the core of what I wanted to say and been trying to say here, is that, is that every, and I, I've written a lot about achievers, from painters to uh, Dr. Bruce Wright to you name it, and almost in, the, in all of their lives, there's an incident. There's a Putzel. There's a Max Putzel. That's his name. Max Putzel. Max Putzel. That's his name. And when he wrote this thing, you know, and all, almost all of them have that in their life. And Malcolm's incident is what you know, is that in the eighth grade, he said he wanted to become a lawyer. And his teacher told him that he, black people couldn't become lawyers, that he should become a carpenter. And Malcolm's response to his puzzle was he left school. And he never went back. He never went back. Now, who would have made a better lawyer than Malcolm X? And that's what we have to fight against here. That's what this Lord expectation is about. That's what the bell curve is about. That's what this slip by Lawrence, the president of Rutgers, is all about. It is about what Putzel was about. Dr. Payne, uh, my name is James Foster. Thank you for the inspiration you have given us as well as given me. And there's something you said that, that caught my attention. And you said charts and, and statistics are undernourished and are designed for purpose. And I myself, I'm a career soldier, fortunately or unfortunately, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, in relation to the charts and statistics, I find that these two can be used to maybe rid you as a black person out of the workplace. I also find that unions and management have a tendency to work together. How can you, as a black, protect yourself against, you know, being pushed out of the workplace by these methods? I think organize. I think you have to organize as African American workers, and you have to organize against your unions. And uh, I think the only way that we will not have rolled back what was achieved in the 60s is that people have done their homework. I mean, what we did is that as soon as I got to Newsday, within six months, we organized the Black Caucus. And the whole idea was to increase the number of, 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 of blacks who were there and to improve the coverage. Then we organized the New York Association of Black Journalists and the National Association of Black Journalists. And I think the idea is that you have to organize. You have to go to people with like experience. Because the point, finally, is not whether or not an individual can achieve and succeed. It is whether or not uh, we will not be vamped on as a group. But, um, it, to your question, you said organize. But if you are single out as the organizer, then you become a troublemaker. I mean, how do you well, I mean, that? Well, I mean, you, that's a, that's a, you have to risk that. I mean, I think that the whole idea of organization is that you're not out there alone. You have to organize. You have to bring people along with you. I mean, I think an autocratic style, you know, which put you way out ahead of the people is, is, is probably not the correct one in the workplace. I think that you have to get people a like mind and, 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 and a whole spread of achievement. You have to get people who have achieved a lot, people who have not achieved quite a much, and, and, and people in the middle ground as well. But organization definitely is the answer, and, and you're going to be attacked. You know, but hopefully that organization, no matter how young it is, can protect you. Okay. Thank you. One last question. Uh, my name is 
Lauren Collins. I wanted to know that every time um, blacks speak into the mic. Every time a black does something great, it seems like um, we're the exception. And I want to know why is it that we always have to prove ourselves to other people and um, we want to change people's minds about us. And do you think it will stop? I heard the, or if we want to change our mind about people, we, we want people to change their minds about us. About us. Yeah, I, you know, her, her question was that uh, the substance of it was that we constantly have to or find ourselves trying to prove to others, you know, uh, how good we are, you know, despite what they may think of us initially. And uh, uh, how do we change the minds, change others' minds about us, yeah. right? And, and I think that that. that that's a, I think the idea, Malcolm's message, and the one that I uh, sign on to, is that the idea is that I think we have to change our minds about ourselves. There's an old Alabama saying that it doesn't matter what you call, but it does matter uh, to what you answer. And so I think that the idea really is to change our minds about ourselves really is a secret. And I think that what you really want to do to the exterior uh, people in the workplace or wherever is to change their behavior. What you want to do is not to change their minds, but to change their behavior. I think Martin Luther King sought to change Ameri white America's mind and a sense of morals and a sense of racism. And I don't think he made one dent in it. However, people behind him, including him, did manage to change their behavior. Uh, and I think that that really is what you should try to do. Change, their change your own mind about yourself. Refuse to accept the fact that, that you are inferior in any way. Uh, change the group's mind about how we view and relate to each other. Uh, and then I think that the larger point, you know, in terms of, of the exterior, uh, in terms of the opposition, is to change their behavior. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of the questions that is raised about uh, Francis Lawrence, who was the president of Rutgers University, is that when people bring up that, here's a man who's been in education for 35 years, he spent 31 years at Tulane University, and when you look into his background up until now, most people say that he has worked against racism, that he has some good work to balance off the slip that he made. And so people said, yes, well, he may have, for instance, one of the things that he's given uh, credit for doing is raising the, pop the uh, black student population at Tulane uh, from 1% up to 10%, you know, and making it one of the highest uh, black enrollments of a private institution in America, you know, which is a laudable achievement, it's true. Uh, so, People then say that, yes, but even in doing that, he still could have done that and yet believe that blacks are genetically inferior and that you lower their standards and bring in this number of black, but you make special arrangements for them. And so they say then he still could believe that. But my answer to that is that it doesn't matter to me what he believes. What matters is his behavior. If you can get him to bring the population of Tulane up to 10%, then we sh that 10% has got to work to bring it up to 20% and to overcome the inertia. So that really is the thing. So I would say don't worry about changing the minds of the opposition, particularly if it's bigots and racists in white America. But I have no hope, by the way. When I write a column, the brother asked early, I have no intention, believe me, I have absolutely no intention of changing white folks' mind. None. None. I don't care about their, uh, I think it's, I think they're, because why? Because bigotry uh, is impregnable to reason. You know, you cannot reach your bias or prejudice with reason. You can reason until the sun turns on its axis uh, in a different way. You know, you can't change them because you can't reach them with reason. So forget about it. What you can do, though, is to exert a consequence for that behavior so that the price that they would have to pay for treating you as a, as, as a second-class citizen is so high that they will stop treating you like a second-class citizen. The price that they would have to pay for calling you genetically and hereditarily inferior is so high that they will stop doing it. That's what they did in South Africa. That's what the Vietnamese did. You know, uh, I guarantee you right now that the Boers and the, the Afrikaners and the white uh, English-speaking so-called in South Africa right now think about the Africa, Africans the exact same way they did 50 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago. They haven't changed their mind one iota. However, they've changed their behavior. And this is what you have to work on. And also, they refer to us as minorities. When did that start, and can it be stopped? Using the, using the word minority, I think we should stop using it. 
Hopefully I didn't use it up here. Uh, minority is, 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 is a catchphrase. And the reason why is because Boudini Brown, you know, I just try to give you succinctly, Boudini Brown, who was uh, uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, uh, advisor, you know, was a very wise man. You know, uh, he had been a merchant seaman to travel around the world. Uh, he wasn't highly educated, but he was a very wise person. And he said, you know, about this color thing. He said, you know, when I travel around the world, one of the first thing you find is that the world is a colored shirt with just a few white buttons on it. Think about that. So the world is a colored shirt. So we, there is no minority. I mean, the population, the American population, the population of this republic, United States of America, including us, is only 4% of the Earth's population. 4% of the Earth's population is in this country. And if you throw in Europe, you still have less than 14%. And what you have is a billion people in China, another billion in the subcontinent of India, 600 million people uh, in, in Africa. 600 million. It's two, almost three times the size. So there is no minority. The minority is a concept, you know, of, of oppression in this society. And I think from this moment on, you should stop using the term minority. I, I think uh, we, we have been treated uh, to a very, very fruitful conversation this, this afternoon. Um, I'm very glad you were able to come. I'm sure that um, you're going to take with you all of the wisdom that uh, Dr. Payne has shared with us. Um, let me turn over to Dr. Byron. Thank you very much for your attentiveness. I hope that this has been an inspiring experience for you. We look forward to seeing you in the classroom. Thanks for coming.